All right, welcome everybody. It's great to see you all here today. Thank you for joining us for the second of three webinars about the importance of water data being facilitated by the Columbia Basin Water Hub and Living Lakes Canada. We would like to begin by introducing the Water Hub team. My name is Paige. I'm the Database and Community Engagement Coordinator at the Water Hub. I'm speaking to you today from Nelson, British Columbia, and I would like to acknowledge that I live and work in the traditional territories of the Sinaix, the Silch, the Tanaha, and the Sequetmec peoples. I'll let Santiago introduce himself as well. Hello, Paige, and thank you very much for that great introduction. As some of you may know, my name is Santiago, and I'm the Applied Innovation and Technology Manager here at the Water Hub and Living Lakes Canada. I am speaking to you today from Casagar, British Columbia, and I would like to acknowledge that I live and work in the traditional territories of the Sinaix, the Silk, the Tanaha, and the Sequekmet peoples. Now, as you people continue to join the webinar, please let us know where you're from, that way we can all uh, kind of get to know each other a little bit more and we can read out some of the places that people are from. And with that, I'll pass it on to Paige. Thank you, Santiago. Yeah, please do let us know where you're joining from as people continue to join us here. We've got someone from Nakus, Alberta, and across the Columbia Basin as well. We've got people from the Slocan Lake, up around Revelstoke, all over the Kootenays. We've got someone from Vancouver Island as well, Smithers, Prince George, Langley, Ontario. So we've got people from across Canada here today. That's great to see. Um, before we get started, I will let you know that there will be time for a question and answer session after all of the presentations are finished. I encourage you to locate the Q&A function in your Zoom controls. As we move through the presentations, if you have any questions, please enter them here so we can answer your question during the Q&A period at the end. We will be recording this session and the recording will be distributed with resource documents to all registrants of the webinar. You will also be able to find the recordings for all three of these webinars in the series on the Living Lakes Canada YouTube channel and website. This is the second webinar in the Why Care About Water Data series hosted by Living Lakes Canada. Living Lakes Canada is a national nonprofit organization that is working towards the long-term protection of Canada's fresh water. Our mission is to elevate water stewardship through community-based monitoring. We believe that this is a way to empower localized climate adaptation and provide support for decision-making by helping to fill important water data gaps. One of our current projects is a multi-year initiative called the Columbia Basin Water Monitoring Collaborative. Part of this project is the Columbia Basin Water Hub, which is a centralized repository for water data. We officially launched the Water Hub in March of this year. Through the Water Hub, we are making data accessible, data which is necessary for adaptation to the climate crisis, watershed security, and environmental stewardship. We encourage you all to reach out to us if you have any questions about the Water Hub or if you'd like to learn more. Santiago will put our contact information in the chat box. So the goal of this three-part webinar series is to provide viewers with an overview of the importance of water data in the Columbia Basin, to introduce a few of the people who are collecting this valuable data, and to highlight the importance of using water data for decision-making. Last week, we looked at the impacts of climate change which are being observed in the Columbia Basin and the need for taking a coordinated approach to water monitoring to help our communities adapt to these changes. In today's webinar, we will continue our water data journey by introducing three water monitoring programs from across the basin who are collecting data and sharing it through the Water Hub. First off, I would like to introduce Carol Letmer. She is the program manager for the Living Lake Canada Upper Columbia Basin Groundwater Monitoring Program. She's based in Invermere. Carol has over 20 years of experience in environmental monitoring throughout Canada and in the Midwestern United States. She has a master's of science in physical geography and a Bachelor of Science in Water Resources Engineering. I'll pass it off to you now, Carol. Oh, 
Okay, I think you should be able to see me and my presentation now. Is that uh, is that correct there, Paige? Yeah, we Looks can see good. It. Thank you, Carol. Perfect. Thank you. Well, thanks, Paige. Um, as uh, Paige was saying, I'm the program manager for the Living Lakes Canada community-based groundwater monitoring program. Uh, what this program does is partner with existing well owners to monitor groundwater, long-term groundwater levels throughout the Columbia Basin. Um, you can see in this picture here, this is one of our well owners that we're working with in Creston, where we're monitoring groundwater levels um, close to the Goat River in this six inch steel cased well. Um, so we're really motivated to monitor groundwater because groundwater is important for people and nature. Uh, we want to ensure long-term water sustainability for communities and for the ecological services that groundwater provides. Um, we know that many people rely on groundwater for irrigation and domestic use. Um, so for example, Interior Health estimates that in the Columbia Basin, that just over 60% of the drinking water systems that they regulate rely solely on groundwater. Um, with climate change, um, we're expecting surface water supplies to become less reliable due to changes in quality and quantity. So we are expecting increasing pressure on groundwater. Um, also throughout the Columbia Basin, we have a really large rural population and many of these rural residents have private domestic wells that um, supply their homes. Um, so we not only care about groundwater for people, um, but also for nature. Um, we know that groundwater discharges to lakes and to creeks um, and that groundwater that's stored underground here, if it's been underground for a long time, it's relatively cool. In our region, it's about um, seven degrees. So when this cool water uh, discharges um, to rivers and creeks, it is really providing cool water that helps um, maintain base flows and keep uh, creeks and rivers cool, especially during the hot and dry summer months. Um, this is really critical for many aquatic species. Um, we do know that this supply of groundwater underground is not endless. Um, if we pump too much water here for our human uses, um, you know, we do risk um, there not being sufficient water flowing uh, to the creeks and streams to provide those ecological services. Uh, the mechanisms of groundwater recharge, so participate, precipitation coming down and recharging, um, the storage and the discharge depend on many things like the climate, the land cover, the types and the distribution of the subsurface materials, the topography, and of course, um, how much water uh, we withdraw for human use. We really need to understand these systems of um, flow and storage in order to be able to effectively protect and manage it. Um, the reason we're collecting groundwater level data from observation wells, which gives us um, background or static water levels, is because water levels are really the fundamental indicator of the stresses acting on an aquifer and how these um, stresses affect the recharge, the storage, and then the discharge. Um, there's definitely been an increase in interest in understanding groundwater systems in recent times, especially in terms of the role that groundwater can play in adaptation to climate change, um, and as well with the implementation of the new Water Sustainability Act in BC, which came into force in 2017. So prior to 2017, groundwater withdrawals were not regulated. Um, now all single domestic users um, must register for a license um, to withdraw water. Just a little sideline here. Uh, there is a deadline coming next March. So if you're an existing non-domestic user of water, um, you probably want to register uh, to secure your groundwater rights um, before this coming March. And the rest of us too, who, um, maybe don't, don't, aren't withdrawing water, um, we probably want to encourage our um, local farmers to, uh, to secure those rights. So what do we know about groundwater in the Columbia Basin? Um, the flow and storage of groundwater is characterized by the mountain environment that we live in. 
It is found underground in the fractures of bedrock, um, as well as in the spaces between the sand and gravels. So the aquifers, the regions um, where we can extract groundwater using a well and pump, um, they're relatively small and fragmented in the Columbia Basin because of our mountainous landscape. So we don't have large aquifers like we see on the plains. Um, we do have the larger aquifers occur in the valley bottoms and the smaller ones um, occur up on the bench lands. Uh, this cross section here is quite simplistic. Uh, in reality, there are lots of different layers of both permeable and impermeable materials that occur uh, in different lenses. Um, so what do we know about the aquifers in the Columbia Basin? Uh, the provincial government has an aquifer mapping program uh, which characterizes the aquifer. Mapping is focused on areas with a history of human use. Uh, in the Columbia Basin, the Provincial Aquifer Mapping Program is mapped to 184 aquifers. Uh, there's a great website by the province which houses the G Wells database where you can access information on wells and aquifers. So you can use the map search feature to find aquifers in your area and links to the mapping reports. The provincial government also has a provincial groundwater observation well network where they have over 200 observation wells distributed across the province where they're collecting long term groundwater level and quality data. Uh, six of these provincial observation wells are within the Columbia Basin. This is a tremendous resource and a lot of the key publications and research that has informed our understanding of groundwater in British Columbia has come from uh, this source. Um, some of the data from these provincial groundwater observation wells go back to the 1960s and it really um, demonstrates the importance of data. So here's an example of, of groundwater level data from a provincial observation well down in Langley, uh, which is in the Hopington Aquifer. And what we see here, um, we've graphed the water level below ground. Um, and then you've got time here on the X axis. So back in the 1960s, the water level was about 12 and a half uh, meters below ground surface. And as you can see, we've seen a continual aquifer depletion uh, to, the, to the year 2000. So, um, you know, snapshots like these really help us analyze and forecast water level trends. Um, we can use these long-term data to monitor changes in storage and recharge, monitor the effects of climate change or drought um, and the effects that groundwater withdrawals are having uh, on our, on our groundwater resources and as well understanding um, groundwater surface water interactions. So long term data extremely useful for for many purposes, but they are quite expensive to get. Um, wells typically cost between 7000 up to $30,000 to drill and then ongoing costs for monitoring. Um, so our, the Living Lakes program um, is capitalizing on existing wells to monitor so that we can get um, additional site specific data for aquifers across the Columbia Basin. Uh, one of the benefits and one of the reasons why we are also motivated to collect groundwater data is to make the invisible visible. We can't really see what's happening underground. Um, so if we can work with community members and organizations to monitor groundwater, they become more engaged and inspired to manage and protect it. Uh, this is us installing a uh, instrumentation in a well on Selkirk College, which we're um, really excited about to engage students in the collection of data. So how does uh, our program work? Um, we identify suitable existing wells to monitor. We're typically monitoring wells that are not used to supply water um, because we don't want to see uh, the effects of pumping. We want to get the background or the static levels. Um, the wells we're currently monitoring are owned by either private landowners, First Nations, water supply system operators, local or regional governments. Uh, we even have one well that's on a Nature Trust of BC property. 
Uh, we sign site access and data sharing agreements with the well owners. And then we install and maintain groundwater level loggers to collect hourly water level measurements. Typically, we visit the wells about three times a year to download and calibrate the data. The well owners can also um, download the data anytime they wish um, using a Bluetooth app on their phone. So it's really engaging uh, the local communities to collect the data. Uh, we review, store, and analyze the data, and then we're sharing the data publicly on two places, the BC Real-Time Water Data Tool, as well as the Columbia Basin uh, Water Hub. So where are we monitoring? Uh, we have 22 wells across the Columbia Basin. Uh, here you can see a map of the Columbia Basin. The red dots are the volunteer observation wells um, from the, uh, the volunteer program with Living Lakes. And then you can see the green dots are the provincial groundwater observation well network wells. Um, we're aiming to monitor across a range of elevations uh, climate conditions, hydrological and water use intensities, as well as um, different aquifer types. Um, so we're monitoring both unconfined and confined aquifers. So in an unconfined aquifer, like this one here, which is near the surface, um, the water in the well is the level of saturation in the soil. So these these aquifers are also known as water table aquifers, where the water level rises and falls based on the level of saturation in the soil. Uh, a confined aquifer, which you can see here, is an aquifer that has um, bounded or that's bounded on either side by impermeable materials such as clay. And so what happens here is because you've got an impermeable layer on top and below, where the water is stored. Um, when you drill a hole through the impermeable layer, the water level will rise to some distance um, above the aquifer. And this distance is related to the pressure in the aquifer here. So in this case, the water level represents the pressure or the head, also called the piezometric surface of, um, of the water in that confined aquifer. So typically unconfined aquifers are closer to the surface, so they'll be impacted by drought conditions sooner. Um, we also find that um, you know, the, the division between unconfined and confined aquifers can be murky because there's often lots of lenses of um, unconfined material. Um, so although there are similarities among aquifer types, each aquifer reacts to changes in timing and amounts of precipitation to changes in surface cover um, or how much water we're extracting. Um, how the aquifer responds to all of those conditions is really dependent on the local site specific characteristics. And so that's why we're trying to measure uh, water levels across the range of aquifers um, that are in our region. So as I was saying earlier, um, the provincial government has an aquifer mapping program and they've mapped 183 um, different aquifers across the Columbia Basin. And again, those are primarily the aquifers where there is a history of human use. Uh, it's interesting to note that 81 out of 183 aquifers are, are confined. So that's almost 45%. These are generally um, smaller aquifers where a lot of the rural population on the bench, on sort of the bench lands rely on, on these kinds of aquifers. And the larger aquifers are generally in the, the river bottoms. Um, so in total between the provincial network and the Living Lakes network, we're monitoring 27 different aquifers across the Columbia Basin. Um, I'm really excited to see the water hub because I do think there are other groups out there collecting long-term uh, aquifer water level data. Um, and so we, um, you know, from industry to um, water level data around my, uh, sorry, around landfill sites. So again, really exciting to see the collaboration. Um, in terms of what of our data showing us, this gives you a bit of an example. 
Um, these are five wells that we're monitoring that are unconfined aquifers. So each row here represents a different aquifer. This uh, axis is the distance below or the water level below ground surface. And then we've got time. We've just graphed the calendar year from January to January. And as you can see, these unconfined aquifers, um, the water levels are all peaking um, at the same time as the spring freshet. And each, each color here represents a, um, a, a different year. What we do see in the unconfined aquifers is much more variability, different trends, peaks happening at different times. And again, this is why we wanna try and monitor a variety of different aquifers is so that we can get those site-specific conditions. Um, we are ex we'd like to expand the program in order to um, monitor again as many aquifers as possible. But of course, expansion of the program is dependent on the availability of suitable wells and sufficient funding long term uh, to support um, to support all the aspects of the program. Of course, the, the program couldn't happen um, without the well owners who volunteer their wells. So big thank you to them, as well as to our all of our advisors, volunteers and supporters. Um, if you want more information on the program, there's a link there to uh, the program's website and my email is there as well. So feel free to reach out at any time if you have any questions. That's great. Thank you so much, Carol. It's great to watch your program grow over the last couple of years. I'll just remind everyone if you have any questions for Carol or any of our other presenters to place your questions in the Q&A box in your Zoom controls. Next up, I'd like to introduce Chad Hughes. Chad is the executive director of the Elk River Alliance and lives in Fernie, BC. Originally from Australia, he has a mining and resource background with a focus on vegetation ecology and environmental impact assessment. He currently runs the Elk River Alliance's community-based water monitoring program and several initiatives looking at long-term examinations of stream volume, temperature, and sedimentation issues stemming from land use activities. Chad graduated from the University of Western Australia with a bachelor's degree in environmental science, majoring in botany and land and water management. Thank you for joining us today, Chad. Thanks a lot. I uh, hope you can all see me here. Uh, yeah, so we're going to do a, a quick review of um, Elk River Alliance or ERA's current uh, data focused projects and programs, um, and then looking specifically at how they would fit into the, the Water Hub. Uh, the Elk River Alliance uh, is a not for profit that aims to use science, education, and community collaboration to ensure the sustainable stewardship of the Elk River watershed. Uh, our organization was formed in 2010 with the idea, oops, sorry, um, with the idea of increasing uh, local knowledge and participation uh, from the community in government, uh, watershed governance. So, Whoops, sorry, there we are. Um, our offices are located in Fernie, but our work covers the entirety of the Elk River watershed. And this area supports a number of important natural systems like uh, old growth forests, crop wood ecosystems, and then provides habitat for a number of important species like grizzly bears and bighorn sheep. And the Elk River also forms, sorry, just a moment. Oh, sorry. Um, and it also forms the core habitat for West Slope cutthroat trout and bull trout in Canada. Um, West Lip Cutthroat Trout was listed nationally as a species of special concern uh, for the BC populations in 2005. And to date, we've seen a few major collapses of populations in the Elk Valley that are of serious concern. And compounding these issues or associated with these issues is a long history of natural resource development and use in the Elk Valley, um, which includes coal mining and private managed forestry, um, which has existed here for about hundred years or more and they form an important part of the economy, so that can't be denied. But we currently have four active steelmaking coal mines in the Oak Valley and two or more uh, with an expansion uh, currently underway or proposed. And we have uh, a very extensive and largely unregulated private logging operations and a rapid increase in urban development over the last few years. So according to the 2018 Oak Valley Cumulative Effects Assessment and Management Report, uh, the Oak Valley, which is around 450 square kilometers, has seen a 177% increase in the total human footprint since the 1950s, uh, up hey, to- Chad, 
I'm we're sorry. Not yeah. seeing, we're not seeing your slides change from one to the next. Oh. Uh, Oh, you sorry, haven't no. changed yet. Okay. That's no, okay. sorry, I haven't Go changed. Ahead. Sorry, uh, my slides are a little, little bare bones here. Um, so basically, we, we've seen a increase from about five percent of the Elk Valley to about uh, twelve percent um, total human footprint if you include logging, and that doesn't include a huge amount of private logging that's happened over the past uh, couple of years since two thousand eighteen. So that takes us to why we're monitoring and why. Um, We've got a number of projects uh, across the valley at the moment, um, and some of our bigger, uh, more data heavy projects are community based water monitoring, uh, sedimentation investigations, uh, hydrometric monitoring, and a new Elk River watershed collaborative monitoring program. Uh, and so we're just going to have a quick look at some of the data types that we're sharing with the, uh, the water hub here. So community based water monitoring or CBWM uh, is our longest running program. It's uh, it takes into account that there is a huge amount of data being collected by industry in the valley, um, primarily around uh, coal, coal mines. So we saw a need to fill in gaps in the data um, around these entities. So coal mining and sorry, government, government uh, monitoring as well. Um, and we've been focusing our efforts on non-mining affected streams. And we're currently looking at 10 sites across five different tributaries. And these sites were chosen because they are areas of community concern, or they have good habitat for cutthroat trout or other species, or they're areas that we'd like to be monitoring, preserving, or restoring. And this has resulted in two restoration projects on two of those streams, uh, uh, Lizard Creek and Alexander Creek in the last few years. Uh, this program was started in 2012 and used a combination of cabin and stream keepers. But in 2019, in an effort to streamline and standardize our data collection, we switched to just using uh, Cabin. And this was important in terms of making our data more comparable and uh, to other um, data that's been collected by other organizations and in industry uh, in order to better facilitate data sharing. And while Cabin data is stored on uh, Canadian government websites, it's a little bit awkward to pull and it doesn't contain the level of metadata that might be needed for other um, data uses. So we're looking on improving the quality of data collected during these activities to increase the utility for other data hub users. Uh, we'll also be including information from our sedimentation studies. Uh, essentially, this project aimed to assess the effects of different types of land use, uh, primarily logging, on the amount of sediment discharged from one of the creeks uh, around Fernie, or Coal Creek. And ideally, this will allow us to highlight the negative impacts that current logging practices have on aquatic health. And this will help, in theory, guide decision makers on sustainable land use and hopefully help us you know, encourage uh, private loggers to increase or uh, improve their, their logging practices. So in this case, we're monitoring one site on Coal Creek plus three sub tributary sites that have different levels of land use. And we're measuring turbidity and correlating with TSS samples or turtle suspended uh, sedimentation samples to establish a relationship between the two. And then using that in combination with flow measurements using both the staff gauge readings and level logger readings at the Coal Creek site. And these are collected uh, by volunteers every single day from about April to uh, July. Um, and we're going to create, well, we have been creating stage discharge relationships that allow an estimation of sediment levels discharged through the channel over time. And hopefully this information can also be used since it's uh, collecting volume as well as temperature um, this can be used by other um, researchers as well uh, to look at uh, flood uh, mitigation and climate change. And we're hoping that the results of this project can then be used to develop a simplified methodology and some protocols for other small community groups to allow them to perform uh, similar work with a vastly reduced budget and uh, reduced technical requirements. And somewhat related to that is our hydrometric monitoring program. Uh, this is looking at, at the moment we have 12 temperature loggers deployed at seven streams across the watershed, and we plan to bring this up to 20 this year. And data loggers were installed in 2020 as part of a long-term study to assess trends and patterns in stream temperature and water level across the Elk River watershed. And monitoring these streams over the next few decades is going to be important in determining the effects of climate change on Elk River tributary hydrology. And it's going to be used to look at uh, West Slope cutthroat trap 
Westlope cutthroat trout, sorry, uh, habitat viability and potential uh, refuge streams. And we'll hope that this will also be used for flood forecasting, habitat monitoring, and be made available to academic researchers. Uh, like most of our work, the sites were chosen because of the presence of viable West Slope cutthroat trout habitat or because of a lack of uh, data in, in that particular area. And we have plans this year to extend this to installing two hydrometric stations that will be measuring temperature as well as volume. And therefore there we, sorry, uh, level, uh, which we can then use using the stage of child relationships to find uh, volume flow as well. And one of these stations will be using cellular telemetry so that we can see the data being produced in real time. And we plan to attend the data from the cloud to the hub. And from there, it can be pulled from the hub to our website where it can be uh, showing a real time graph of, of water level in the upper elk. And we're hoping that this will increase community participation and understanding of how water affects, is affected and affects by uh, everything in the valley. But we're also working with rafting and kayaking enthusiasts to install uh, level loggers on the Lower Elk and Wigwam rivers. And this is going to allow rafting companies and kayakers to better assess river conditions, meaning that in addition to a more abstract long-term use of hydrometric data by academia and government and land managers, we're going to have an immediate recreational and safety benefit for river users, meaning that there's a larger subset of the community is going to be directly impacted by the water data that we're collecting and displaying on the water hub. And finally, the Elk River Watershed Collaborative Monitoring Program is something new and ambitious we've been working on over the last few months. And this is going to rely heavily on the water hub. Uh, by using scientific, local and indigenous knowledge, we aim to identify data uh, that's needed to better understand the cumulative impacts of activities impacting the Elk River, including mining, forestry, agriculture, urban development and recreational water use, including fishing. Uh, the goal is to build an independent, unbiased and credible environmental monitoring program that will create a comprehensive understanding of watershed health and inform management actions so that the effects of cumulative stresses can be predicted and actioned on before they become uh, a critical concern. So as I mentioned earlier, there's a, a large number of industries in the valley and many of them are doing a huge amount of monitoring and data collection work, particularly the mining industry. But even though there's a lot of work being done to monitor and understand the impacts of individual industries or individual companies on specific sites and usually looking at specific um, impactors or, or parameters, uh, there's a, a lack of how all these factors combine uh, and interact. And there's a lack of data sharing, which means that a lot of this information is being siloed in, in private databases, which isn't much use to anyone. Uh, as a real world example of the cumulative effects that we wanna be looking at, uh, in 2019, part of the Fording River saw a loss of 90% of the cutthroat trap population. And we're still investigating this, um, but it's likely that it was the result of a number of stresses working in combination that led to the population crash. So that could include sediment from forestry, plus selenium from mining operations, and then other things like climate change that may have been affecting uh, flow regimes that we don't fully understand yet. And unfortunately, there is insufficient data around that area to tell if there were similar issues on non-mine affected tributaries in the area, which further confuses the issue. And if we had a more holistic and comprehensive monitoring program, it may have been that we'd have more information on the surrounding non-mine affected streams, and we'd have a better understanding of why exactly that particular area saw the crash. So we're working to build relationships and connectivity across organizations and people in the watershed, including uh, government departments, uh, the Tanaha Nation Council, uh, river stakeholders such as mining companies, consultancies, uh, other NGOs and land trusts, plus recreational users, particularly uh, rod and gun clubs and fishing guides. And ultimately we plan to bring together all these entities and stakeholders uh, under one tent to uh, create an agreement to share data, uh, eliminate overlap and identify knowledge gaps. And then from there, we can develop a plan to carry out the additional monitoring needed to fill the gaps so we can uh, have a better understanding of what stresses are impacting the valley and how. So, we're currently in the first year of development, but our goal at the moment is to build a credible and engaged set of partners who represent a balance of watershed interests. And we're looking at how organizations can contribute to the development and implementation of this program and seeking out contributive and supporting partners. Uh, we're already talking to potential partners about data sharing agreements, which would unlock data that is currently unavailable to the public. 
And the collaborative will then once established, uh, work together to define the critical questions, the scope of monitoring required to answer those questions, the design of the monitoring program needed to get those that information and then guide the implementation of this program under the management of the collaborative, including the Elk River Alliance. Uh, the idea is that we are fostering a more informed Elk Valley and allowing everyone in the community to have a better understanding of the watershed issues and also weighing on local watershed decision-making through informed decisions. So obviously that's where the Columbia Basin Water Hub is coming in. Uh, we are a very small not-for-profit and we do not have the capacity or the resources to create a database or manage the amount of data that this program will generate, much less host data from the range of partners that we've been speaking to. Uh, obviously the Water Hub is a critical component of the program and our plan is to use the Water Hub to facilitate the collaborative and share the data on a much wider scale. Uh, we are currently in the process of uploading all of Elk River Alliance's data to the hub. And once we have data sharing agreements in place with other entities in the Valley, uh, we'll be uploading our partners' data as well. But we much prefer it if they can manage and upload their own data through their own profiles to better uh, demonstrate their level of involvement in the collaborative. And currently we've made significant progress with several mining companies and regional trusts, and we're continuing to negotiate uh, with potential new data holders in the area. Um, ultimately, all partners involved will have full control of what data they're willing to share. So obviously some sensitive data may not be shared, uh, or more likely uh, environmentally sensitive data like uh, spawning locations will be made not available to the general public, but still be there uh, available to researchers and decision makers if needed. Uh, the hub has the additional benefit to us of having a rigorous quality control aspect, which can then be used to give specifics about the type of data and the quality of the instruments used, which allows our partners to assess how valid uh, that information is for the purposes of any particular monitoring component. And more importantly, the data can be uploaded regardless of data grade, which means that a wider breadth of the community can meaningfully contribute uh, qualitative data or non-standardized information. And we believe that that's really important so that uh, all sorts of data from all sorts of users uh, can be uploaded um, and be made accessible to land managers and resource groups. Um, and it just generally be made available to the broader community. Uh, so that's, that's the end of our story. Um, we'd just like to make a quick uh, shout out to all of our funders and partners of which there are quite a few at this stage. Uh, if you have any further questions that go outside the, um, the question and answer period, uh, please send me an email. I don't have my email here, but it's uh, chat at elkrivalliance.ca. And I think Santiago might be able to put that in the chat. Um, yeah, thanks a lot. Fantastic. Thank you, Chad. I'm excited to see all of the data that these projects bring to the Water Hub. Next up, we have Richard Johnson. Richard is a professional engineer registered in Alberta, where he worked most of his professional career. His work involved reservoir monitoring and modeling, looking at flow through porous media and geology. Together with his wife and business partner, Susan, he has taught water analysis and interpretation to engineers and geologists for over 20 years. Richard graduated from the University of Saskatchewan with a degree in geological engineering, and his current interests include interpreting bird song recordings using machine learning and remote sensing of the environment using satellite data. Richard shares his insights and expertise as well as an advisor for Living Lakes Canada. Thank you for joining us today, Richard. Thank you, Paige. I hope to answer the questions posed in this first slide uh, in the course of, of showing you a whole bunch of other things as we go along. And uh, let me just, there we go. So I'm going to go right back to very basic and go with a very simple water cycle or hydrological cycle. And you're all familiar with this, but let me point out something and direct your attention to the color change that I'm showing on this slide. And what this is showing is the aging of water from its birth until it goes retires the old folks home in the ocean. And during the course of that, aging, we're looking at not so much time, but the experience the water goes through. So here's a, a little anthropomorphized, anthropomorphizing of water. Water uh, remembers things, but not the way we remember things. We share 
uh, data with each other by words and pictures. And the water is, is a universal, uh, what do they call it, a universal solvent. So it remembers everything that it touches. I'm going to turn off my video so that you can focus on what, what on my slides here. Okay, so if it remembers everything that it touches, is there another way to look at the age of water, the experience of water? And the answer is yes, there is. My slide is not advancing. Here we go. Try that. There we go. And we'll use the chemical cycle as a way of aging water. So this looks like the same blue diagram, except now we're looking at how much chemical uh, data there is re recorded in water. And it looks, again, fairly simple. But here's where the problem comes in, people. People uh, contaminate these, uh, the water with all kinds of things like road salt, fertilizer, calcium fluoride spread on, on uh, to keep down dust and all of the uh, other chemicals that we add to water. So is there a way to get rid of that dark greenish blob and actually focus on just the chemical cycle itself? And yes, there is. I'm going to do it by just a click with a button, but here is how I uh, propose to do it in real life. I need to go someplace where there isn't many people. And so here are 19 sites in the uh, Northwest Territories uh, showing uh, data points that are, have been collected by uh, Climate Change Canada and Parks Canada over a 20 year cycle. And there's not much uh, human interaction up here. So what I want you to focus on at this point is the three little arrows the light blue one here and the uh, dark blue one and the purple one. And you'll see the significance of those in particular. So what does, what does the, uh, it tell us? Well, the light blue sample, the sample point is uh, on the outlet of Artillery Lake in the Northwest Territories. And the, you can see from this little picture which I've stolen from Google Earth, uh, that there's not much up here, no soil, mostly just rock and a little lake sitting there in the background. So if I take a look at the data that is available on these sites, I have uh, a graph uh, showing, which is showing the specific conductance uh, of the water over a 20 year period. And it's on uh, five different sites. So let's talk for a second about what the, what is actually being measured at these sites. The sites are measuring specific conductance. And if I take a battery and connect a wire to the positive and a wire to the negative and stick those bare wires into the ground, into the water and measure whether current will flow, uh, whether that water will conduct the electricity, we'll call that conductance. And there's ways to standardize it, da 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 da. The main thing to recognize is that specific conductance fluctuates on a yearly basis. I have 20 years showing on the graph and I have 20 fluctuations. Now we've all, we're all familiar with these uh, being related to freshet. And all of these low points are when there's a lot of water flowing and the chemistry is uh, uh, diluted. I'll also point out this little brown one at the bottom, which doesn't seem to listen to the, to the cycles of nature. And I'll talk about that in a second. What I can do with conductance is I can convert it to something we call total dissolved solids. If you take a liter of seawater, dump it into a, uh, onto your stove, into a pot and boil it, you're going to get about two tablespoons of salt, mostly sodium chloride. If I take a sample of water from uh, a well which we're going to talk about uh, by the cusp and uh, boil it off. I'm going to get a, a total dissolved solid similar to here, to what's shown here. And the, if I point to the 30, 350 line here, that is one hundredth, one one hundredth of the salinity of seawater. 
So I would have to boil off a hundred liters of water of this type of water to get to seawater, or to get to the same amount of salt as seawater, and it wouldn't be sodium chloride. It's more likely to be uh, calcium bicarbonate. So this is a, a pattern diagram that allows us to visualize what water is telling us. Here are the 19 sites that I looked at in the uh, territories. And you'll see by the shape of these that there's a similarity. And the conductance reflects the area between the red curve, red curve and the blue curve. And there's our very fresh artillery lake. And there is the outlet of Great Bear Lake. And I also would direct your attention to the three purple ones. The three purple ones all occur in the same valley and a little bit of artificial intelligence in my computer confirmed that. Uh, and that was uh, an interesting thing uh, for me to find that I can do with, with fresh waters what I've been doing for 30 years with uh, waters that are millions of years old. So the takeaway from this is every water has its own fingerprint. In other words, I can, using this system, identify waters as being like each other or completely different. So that's interesting, but what good is it? Well, let's go to a real life example. This is a picture of Box Mountain, the North Slope of Box Mountain here. Here's the cusp over uh, up on the left hand side. And this little greenish po point is uh, Box Lake. And right here, there's a whole bunch of people that are living on the edge of the forest. And uh, there is a planned wildfire risk reduction to try and mitigate uh, the effects of a, of a wildfire that might start on Box Mountain. So we're trying to run a balance here between the people that live here and to save them from being burned out of their homes and at the same time, uh, not destroying their water supplies. And there's some uh, 200 or so people live on this slope here and they are all mostly living, they all have their own water systems and they're, most of them are living on various forms of surface water or aquifer water. So I'm gonna strip away the, the trees on this and move on to looking at where they are getting their water from. So the green area, if you remember, is up in this area up in here, where the wildfire risk reduction will be taking place. And wildfire risk reduction involves cutting down trees, scraping up uh, uh, lower ladder fuels and fuels on the ground. And during the course of that, it may very well impact, particularly those people that are getting their water from creeks, which are the blue spots on this map. Uh, there's all the people uh, that are getting water from springs, which probably will be less impacted. But again, uh, there's a lot of red spots on, the, on this map. And finally, there's a, a number of water wells. And uh, this is only a portion of them. These are the ones that are recorded with the government, but there's a lot of people that have hand dug wells, etc. So how does this all come together? Well, the Box Mountain Watershed Users, uh, Watershed Alliance, pardon me, uh, are gathering water. And on our first gathering system, first gathering date last uh, month, we picked up over 30 samples of water that people brought in. As you can see, somebody delivering a, a water sa sample here. Uh, they bring in their samples to the uh, to a common site here monthly. Uh, we've uh, been working with volunteers. We have eight volunteers that have volunteered to uh, run the test instruments and learn how that how to do this analyzing. And as the Arrow Lake Environment Stewardship Society, we are checking the results, making sure they're doing it okay, and uh, submitting the data to the water hub because there, that will be the ultimate repository. And we plan on doing this for a year and uh, 
at the end of the year, we'll do a, a report on it and see what we can figure out. So here's, this, here's what we're doing monthly with the volunteers. We're collecting conductivity, turbidity, pH, and I'm also working on a, a, some strip uh, analysis of alkalinity and hardness. Once a year, we'll also do a full analysis, including all the metals, all of the potential fertilizers, and uh, confirm all these major ions, which are being measured by the conductivity, because conductivity is only measuring ions. It's not measuring the, the other minor metals that the water has touched. So here is a much simplified and, and much cheaper version of, of, uh, of one of Carol's diagrams. And here's what we're, a slice of the Box Mountain looks like. We're looking at springs, which are these, which is this yellow, yellow as a sand aquifer. And at the, if it reaches the surface here, it will discharge and people are using that for some water source. Here's another shallow sand where they've drilled a well into it. Here's a creek and here's another uh, aquifer here. And here's deep wells in fractured bedrock. And we've already identified just in the in the samples that we've taken in the last two months that uh, the deep wells have a higher TDS uh, than the shallow wells. In other words, the bedrock aquifer uh, is much, uh, I'm not going to say saltier because that implies that it's sodium chloride and it's actually, it's actually calcium bicarbonate. Uh, we looked at the cycles that that it goes through and that is connected with the freshet. So the conductivity response, uh, if that shows up in water wells, then we can see that it has a close connection to the surface. And coming back to that takeaway that I talked about, if we have shallow wells that have different conductivities and therefore have different fingerprints we can actually identify whether this, whether a well in this aquifer is the same as a well over in this aquifer. And then going back to what Carol said, aquifers with the same elevation are probably connected. If they're not, uh, don't have the same water elevation in them, they are not connected. Again, interesting, but what do we do with this, all this? Well, we can completely identify to the best of our ability anyway, uh, what of these water sources are vulnerable to contamination from uh, work being done on the surface. Uh, we can also look at, at how they're related. We can understand how the aquifers are, are shifting and moving in, uh, how the water is moving in these aquifers. And uh, we can look at the hydrology of, of the uh, aquifers, which I'm throwing out as Carol's challenge because I work with Carol on other other things as well. And this uh, hopefully will supply us with a few uh, wells that we might be able to monitor uh, uh, under her program. And here's a couple of broad scale conclusions. We can fingerprint the water. We can use the water to completely interpret whether aquifers are connected, where the water is coming from, where it's going to, and all of this helps people. Thank you. That's great. Thank you, Richard. I like how you tied together the water quality and the groundwater pieces here. So thank you to all of our wonderful presenters. I'll mention again, all three of these monitoring programs have or will be uploading their data to the Columbia Basin Water Hub. I encourage you all to visit the Water Hub and explore the data that they have shared, along with data collected by many other groups across the basin. Our database continues to grow as we collaborate with new groups and organizations. If anyone is interested in contributing data or if you have any questions, do contact our team. So we will now move into the Q&A section of our webinar. We've got a number of questions here for our panelists. The first one I think is directed towards Chad. They are wondering why will industry share their water data with the hub when their data may show negative impacts of their business to water quality? Um, that's a, sorry, you can hear me? 
Yeah, yeah, that's a good question. Um, we hope that industry will see the benefits in being open and transparent uh, about their data. Um, these days, the community and the public at large is a lot more informed and wants to know what's going on. And we're hoping that as a gesture of goodwill, if nothing else, um, they'll be willing to share that data to show that, you know, there's nothing sketchy going on behind the scenes. Um, I'm fairly confident that most, if not all companies in the area are acting in good faith. Um, but another thing will be that a lot of companies have data that other companies want. And by sharing the data, they'll have access to um, other companies' data, which will in total decrease uh, total costs of, of data collection. Um, not to mention the additional information that we'll be collecting as part of the monitoring collaborative. So we hope that this collaborative is going to be a net benefit for all the members. Uh, no one's going to be um, sort of put out by it and nobody's going to end up uh, having it cost them more money than, than, than it would otherwise be uh, operating alone, if that makes sense. That's great, thank you. I think the next question is for you as well. They're wondering what type of velocity meter are you using to collect your velocity flow information to develop your stage discharge rating curve? Someone else also asked what type of hydrometric meters you're using. Yep, um, for hydrometric meters, we're currently using um, uh, Herbo Logger U20s for level, uh, but we'll be upgrading to, I think, um, onset uh, micro RX and a micro, sorry, an, uh, an hobo logger something 2000. Um, and this is so that we can use a, a more vented system, which will have an integrated uh, atmospheric control, um, which will allow for a better upload um, to the, the water hub. And with regards to water velocity, we're currently using a global, uh, a global water um, velocity meter, which isn't great and part of our plans over the next few years is to increase and improve our data collection which incl includes uh, equipment so we hope to have a, a little bit more um, standardized uh, collection equipment over the next year or two. Great thank you our next question is from Zidra Hammond wondering is there a standardized approach for uploading data into the hub to make sure it is user friendly to search for info? Uh, yeah, I guess I can take that one on. Uh, thank you for your question. And uh, yeah, we do. We have a naming convention that uh, allows for easy searchability and the Water Hub has also great filtering options. So you'll be able to search either by organization, file type, and or Water Hub data grade. So we do have our own little system. If you want to find out more, just uh, let us know. We can provide you all the resources needed there. And we also have upload templates, which currently we're encouraging the use of, which then make the previews for tabular data within the water hub very clear and people can explore those rather than having to download them and having to download a lot of files and try to search through them. We also have PDF preview ability. So for all the reports that exist within the base and that have been done throughout all the years, you'll be able to easily see them within the water hub. And so we also have um, kind of standard processes for the um, QA, QC of the data that we upload. And this is not so much QA, QC for data quality per se, um, but we're ensuring that we have complete metadata as well as um, just taking a look at it, ensuring that we're taking the right processes to make sure our data has um, is findable, accessible, interoperable, and um, reusable to ensure uh, that it complies with the fair principles of open data. And so those were our, our main um, goals there. So I hope that answers your question. And Paige, if you have anything to add to that as well, please do. That's a great answer. I don't see any other questions here. Um, so I think we can close the Q&A session. If anyone has any additional questions, feel free to send any of our presenters an email or contact the Water Hub team. Uh, thank you for joining us all today. We appreciate your time and attention. Thank you as well to our sponsors, including RBC, the Real Estate Foundation of BC, the Columbia Basin Trust, Watersheds BC, the Sitka Foundation, and the Vancouver Foundation for making this webinar series possible. We will follow up early next week with a webinar package that includes the resources mentioned in today's session and a recording of the webinar. We look forward to seeing you all next week. 
when Jennifer Yao from Passmore Laboratory and Jason Schleppi from Ecoscape Environmental Consultants will share their stories about water data being used to inform decision-making and policy. Thanks everyone, have a great day.